you ever so much for coming. It's really lovely to hear to, to see you all here and some of you have actually come to this before so apologies if there is a little bit of overlap with last year's one. And um, Before I get properly started it's quite useful to know how many of you are following the OCR curriculum. So it's kind of nearly everybody but not not all so I, I will focus a bit on what we've done to help um, OCR teachers particularly but but not too much don't worry it's it's globally relevant to everybody so um, I'm going to talk about um, the Churchill Archive for Schools site mainly I'm going to give you an introduction to the Churchill Papers which is our kind of flagship collection which I've been lucky enough to work on for over 20 years and um, I'll cover using primary sources to teach history and how we can help you with that. And I'm going to end with a demonstration of the site. I must admit, I'm going to just declare it at the outset. I am a little bit nervous about trying to talk and navigate the site at the same time, as well as being filmed. So just bear with me. I'll try and, I'll try and do my best um, and just stop me and ask questions if you're thinking, where's she going now? What, what, what do you want about? That's absolutely fine with me. Um, and then I'm going to end with a little bit on how you can take it further, which I very much hope you'll want to by the end. So um, just to kick off then, I'm going to start with just talking a little bit about what archives are. So I'm sure you all know that they're primary sources. They're different from secondary sources, books, journal articles, things you can find in libraries, mainly because they're always contemporary with the events that they describe and also because they were created by the people involved. So we sometimes say to researchers that don't forget that this means that they weren't created to help you with your research, so very different to a textbook. But that's, that, that shouldn't be off-putting. There's lots of ways of um, putting them to good use. We've got, as well as the Churchill Papers, uh, an enormous collection in the Archive Centre. So the, the Archive Centre is the building on the left there. It's just kind of behind us here, right in the heart of the college. We've got Winston Churchill's papers, but we've built up a collection of over 600 other archives around that core collection. We've got Margaret Thatcher's papers, Neil Kinnock's papers. We know that Gordon Brown is going to give us his archive in due course. So we're a, we're a hub, really, mainly for 20th century history, particularly political. Um, the problematic thing about archives really is that they are absolutely unique. If you lose one or damage one, you can't just buy another one and replace your stock. So we have to look after them very, very carefully and try and balance preserving them for perpetuity with making them as accessible as we would, you know, taking them to the widest possible audience we can. So um, that is the main reason why doing things digitally and doing things online is a fantastic thing for us because we've, we're actually quite limited in terms of physical space. We have researchers from all over the world coming to us and we only have six spaces in our reading room. And if we have visits to the Archive Centre, then we have to turn our researchers away. So it's quite hard to balance the needs of um, providing access with the, the physical space, which is a challenge you have at Chartwell as well, I think. Um, so the Churchill papers then, they are Churchill's personal papers. So there are a lot of copies of, um, there are a lot of copies of official documents in there. And as you no doubt already know, he had a lot of different facets to him. Prime Minister, politician, statesman, we all know that. Um, but also a writer, he's somebody who lived by his pen, he supported himself from the money he made by writing. So it won't surprise you to learn that it's an enormous collection. He, um, his career spanned the reigns of six monarchs from Queen Victoria to our present Queen. So, you know, it's a mighty, it was a mighty life and it's a mighty collection. It's in about two and a half thousand of the boxes you can see on the right there. Um, Churchill had a very strong sense that he was going to be someone, he was going to be significant. He also thought he was going to die young. Um, and both of those things led him to keep absolutely everything, which is why we've got such a wonderful collection now. And what I absolutely love about it is very much like the photo you showed us of him on the roof 
be actually is that it, it gives you an insight into the whole man so there's an awful lot of things that you would absolutely expect in there we've got wonderful drafts for his famous speeches and his broadcasts and those are really important lots and lots of government documents and important sort of contemporary evidence about the war but we can also see the whole the whole man, the, the father, the husband, we can see the pressures on him, we can trace it through correspondence with his peers, his political contemporaries, but all sorts of other people as well. You can see him being kind to people who worked at Chartwell, for example. So I really love the fact that searching the collection, if, if you want to do it, you can you can look at what was passing across his desk uh, on a particular day. And I think often textbooks and things aren't written like that. They're written, especially about the war, they tend to sort of tell you the story of the Desert War or the Battle of Britain. You know, and what you have to remember is that Churchill was living through that at the time and kind of having to keep across the whole picture. So the archive lets us do that. And because he wrote so much, so many books, there's the history of the First and the Second World War, but also many other books and articles, we can, as well as see the contemporary evidence, so what was happening at the time, passing across the desk, we can look at his later reflections about those events and how he also crafted his narrative of them. And uh, if you want to, you can think about how important that narrative has been and how that's shaped the stories, uh, the myths that we, we think of about Churchill now. So I think it's a fabulous collection. I've, I'm really lucky to have been able to work on it. And I'm also very passionate about trying to make the most of it in terms of widening access to it. So um, whatever you think of the new national curriculum, it has been fantastic for archive centres like us because of the requirement to use primary sources. It's brought schools to us. So for many years, we wrote to the schools around here offering visits to the archive centre and just got nowhere. Um, it was too difficult to come out of the classroom. But the, the change in the curriculum has meant we've had a fairly steady stream of students coming to the site now, which is absolutely lovely. And I've had the chance to work firsthand with those visitors and it's, it's just been really inspiring to me. So we had a wonderful group in the summer from some Sutton Trust students. So they're about widening participation. So children from less advantaged backgrounds who wouldn't necessarily think about coming somewhere like Cambridge have a residential week here. And we do a big part of that and, and take the collection to them. So we collected some feedback from them at the end and it really was lovely. Some of it was, it was awesome because these words were written on these documents that had major impacts on our lives today. Incredible, almost felt like meeting your favorite celebrity. I was in awe. And then my favorite history fangirl moment, <laughs> which kind of said it all really. Um, so I don't want you to kind of take my word for it though, because I'm not a teacher, I'm, I'm an archivist, I'm a curator. I, I love working with school groups, but I don't do the classroom every day. I don't, I don't have the pressures that you have um, of that. So I'm going to bring in some of the videos that we've put onto the Churchill Archive for Schools website to give you the broader context. So the first one, I'm hoping you've got some name recognition of Ben Walsh here. You're brilliant. I love saying his name because everybody kind of nods and, and, and recognises it. We were really lucky that in working on the Churchill Archive for Schools site, which is something that we've developed in partnership with Bloomsbury Publishing, we got Ben Walsh to be our educational consultant. So he's an exam, a senior examiner on exam board, written lots of history textbooks, but most importantly for us, he's worked with a lot of similar organisations like the British Library and the National Archives for their learning curve. So he's got a real um, knowledge and experience of how you can use digital technology to teach history. So I'm going to let him talk to you a little bit about using the Churchill Archive for Schools. Hello, my name is Ben Walsh. As well as textbook authoring, teaching and examining, I'm also the editor for the Churchill Archive for Schools resource. Churchill Archive is an internationally recognised resource. It's a digital archive of modern world history, ranging from something like 1874 through to 1965. There are around 800,000 pages of documents. 
Secondary schools anywhere in the world can now register absolutely free of charge for this archive. But 800,000 documents sounds pretty daunting, doesn't it? How would you know where to start? That's why we've developed, also free of charge, the Churchill for Schools website. It's designed to help students build their confidence in using primary sources while they're studying key events of 20th century world history. As soon as you've registered your school for the Churchill Archive, make sure you visit churchillarchiveforschools.com so you can get the most out of these resources. Churchill for Schools has already got 16 investigations and there are more on the way. Each investigation is based around a big challenge, a big question about 20th century history that the students have to tackle. They have to do that using the primary sources from the collection, but there are plenty of uh, supporting materials, background information, and other types of support that help them decode these sources. The list of investigations reads like a who's who of world history key topics. We've got the Holocaust, we've got Gallipoli and First World War, we've got Pearl Harbor, we've got the Cold War and nuclear weapons, and many more besides. Research shows that students find it very beneficial to try and adopt the mindset of the historian when using historical sources. So that's why in our primary skills guide on the website, we ask them to tackle questions like, what is an archive? How do we use letters as, as evidence? How do we use cartoons and other visual images as sources? So these are all key questions which really help students develop their understanding of the use of sources, the ability to use evidence, and of course their understanding of the topics. I don't want to cut the music off. Um, so that's a, um, a really good overview from Ben. The next two videos I'm going to show you are also quite short. Um, we made them last winter so we as I'll show you when we get going on the site it's probably primarily aimed at using it in the classroom but there's no reason why you have to stick at that and one of the things we did with it was have a schools debating competition so we had about seven schools coming from year eight through to the end of sixth form well, probably they were there they probably weren't the end of sixth form they were probably too busy revising the year below that but we got teams of them to use our investigations and the questions that we put on the site and use the documents to kind of challenge one another and it was really fantastic to to see that in action and Bloomsbury Publishing came to make the films because what we wanted to do was try and make it um, make it very clear really how you can use this stuff and, and really inspire people with it. So the next two videos are the pupils and their teachers who came for that uh, school debate and they'd all done, I think, various amounts of pre preparation work using the site beforehand. Interestingly enough, the sixth form winners were practicing their speech on the train on the way here and they managed to beat a team that had been rehearsing for ages. So I don't know whether the adrenaline just powered them through, but it was quite a quite a surprising story to me anyway. So here they are. So here are five reasons why you should register your school for the Churchill Archive and make use of the Churchill Archive for Schools.com resources. One, you'll build students' confidence in using primary sources, an important historical skill that appears on school curricula worldwide. Textbooks tend to digest the material for students, they regurgitate it in the right order, sometimes they, there's a narrative voice in the textbook, they'll have a teacher possibly as well talking to them about this, but with the archive, quite often the student is alone with the source and the screen, and they have to really find their feet with it. You're, you're, you're there, you know what I mean, you can imagine you're in his head sort of, and looking at what he personally thought about what was going on at that time. The Churchill Archives, it shows you all the different intricate ways that history works. You see the letters sent from Churchill to Clement Attlee about how he was trying to convince and do certain things. You see the side you don't usually see as we experience it in real life. You see everything's happening behind the scenes. Two, you'll be encouraging them to engage with historical events and make connections to the present day. Being able to contextualise events and understand historical concepts like change, continuity, cause and consequence will make students better historians. Well, I think mainly people talk about the differences um, between how the past and where we are now, but I think what's more interesting is looking at the similarities of, of 
understanding that we are all connected somehow through our own universal history. What I enjoy about studying history is that um, that I can go back in like time and see all the amazing people um, and what they've done and how they've helped the world to become what it is like today. Three, the investigations will help students understand key topics in modern international history and the wide range of investigations means there's something to suit everyone. My group studied Did Nuclear Weapons Make the World Safer between 1945 and 1951, which then allowed us to look through the archives and the sources that we were given to help us answer the question. I found interesting how um, the suffragettes used violence instead of peace to be peaceful and law abiding. Four, the resources are very flexible, so you can use them in whatever way suits your teaching, with the whole class, for group work, or as homework assignments. And what's great about the Churchill uh, Archive as well is you have a simplified resource and then you have a, a more detailed resource. So also that differentiates for children and, and, and being a secondary school teacher that's very important because all children are different types of learners. It's important that our students can have access to that. Obviously you can't travel from all over the country to the archives, so to have them arriving in your school computer room is a real asset to history teachers. Five. And last, but by no means least, the activities will help students develop the research skills that are vital for success in higher education. It's never too early to start. This has helped me develop skills like analysing language, being able to pick out the information that's just necessary, also being able to like skim read and just um, pick out the quotes that are the best for your argument or whatever you're learning about. You know, seeing the Year 8 students and having a go at that and evaluating sources in a really uh, mature way like a historian does it's going to go a long way, I think, for their development as young historians, definitely. So please join the 2000 schools who've already registered for the Churchill Archive and make the most of this fantastic resource by visiting churchillarchiveforschools.com. Great. So there's just one, one last one, uh, another short one, and then I promise I'll start sort of doing my bit and talking again. You know, I was at university only three, four years ago myself, and I remember the real struggle of you know, writing two dissertations at once and having to go into a massive old book of primary sources and thinking, you know, what on earth am I going to use here and how can, you know, what is useful, what isn't? And I think giving them that opportunity now to start to think about what sources are useful, why, what are their limitations. Um, it's great practice. What I like about studying history is looking back on what has happened in this world and, may, and I want to see how that reflects on um, today life. I like studying history because it tells us about events in the past which, which may have influenced events that are happening now. It enables them to become critical adults and in an era of fake news, then we need to go back to the, the sources, the primary sources, and so the, the archives here are the, mother, the mothership of truth. Like a focal length of a camera, you can only look at certain things, but when you broaden it up, you can see this whole bigger picture. In history, I enjoyed that. It gives us the opportunity to like, widen our knowledge from, diff, from different aspects of our past, because usually nowadays, everyone's on their phones and all that. So we don't really get to discover about our past and how it comes to bring us to how we live now. Seeing real documents and understanding, exploring real documents, like from letters to um, acts, um, conversations, things that you would never ever get in a textbook. Because remember, a textbook is someone's an opinion, it's an interpretation of history. I found that um, when I was looking at the documents in the original reports, I found that like really interesting and amazing, like because like it made me love history more and like got me a bit interested in the topic and if like I would like to carry that on in GCSEs. What the archive allows us to do is actually take history from a textbook and make it real life. So there we are. Um, hopefully that's kind of given you a more kind of convincing um, introduction from educators really, not from archivists, because we can't really tell you um, 
how to teach and we wouldn't dream of trying. Um, but I'm going to move on now to demonstrating the actual site. And just before I kind of dive into it really, I need to say that the only reason we've been able to develop this site is because we were lucky enough to get a philanthropic donation. So we got a million dollars, which enabled us to develop this site for schools across the world. And also it uh, entitles secondary schools in this country and globally to request a free subscription to the Churchill Papers um, publication. So that's the, the bit up here. So you do need a subscription for that, but you can get one for free. It's just a matter of registering. But as I showed you the boxes on the shelves, the Churchill Papers is an enormous collection. And what we hope with this website that we've done with Bloomsbury is that we're trying to make it manageable for you. Um, it would be probably easier for you if we were able to kind of um, badge it up more explicitly for the natural nas national curriculum but because we've been charged with making it globally accessible we can't really do that very well oh, I'm not getting on very well with this mouse um, but I just wanted to highlight really that there are there is a link here to the OCR curriculum and what we've done there it's a download if you click it but it's got the OCR curriculum set out with links to the particular bits of this site which will work nicely with the the curriculum that you're following so we're, we're trying to make it easier so I'll just try and create a little bit more space for this mouse so I'm going to do um do a tour or oh, do a tour of it struggling a bit with the practicalities here okay I think I'm all right now so um <coughs> one of the things that we were really pleased to add to the site is this bit our primary source skills guide when we added this to the site we were lucky enough to get it mentioned in the TES so we were really pleased about it basically I'd like you to think of it as a toolkit when we have the students visiting the archive centre and we show them documents I basically give them a version of this and what I say is you know use the questions that you've got on this sheet ask them of the document or the archive that's in front of you and the answers that you come up with to those questions is your interpretation of the archive and that is as valid as anyone else's and I always end up my visits by asking the students to go and stand by the archive that's had the biggest impact on them. Maybe they love it, maybe they hate it, maybe it makes them feel cross. But I get them to talk to me just very briefly about why they've chosen that document. And I've worked here for over 20 years on this collection and every single time there's at least something I'd never thought of and that's kind of interesting and new to me. So this toolkit starts with the explanation of what an archive is. So we covered that at the beginning, but also a nice big long list of all the different types of primary sources. We've got all of these things in the archive centre and many of them are on this site. And then we move on to why archives are useful, which hopefully we've already covered a bit, um, and what this site is. But what I really wanted to kind of zoom in on a little bit is this bit at the bottom, the toolkit bit. So what we've set out here is a framework for looking at any different um, type of archive and a list of questions that you might want to ask to come up with a, a response to it. So I was, I did a, a talk earlier in the summer to a different group of teachers and they said, oh, this is fantastic. You've done everything for us. Can you do it for everything else? And um, I said, well, no, but you can use this toolkit for everything else. You can, you know, find archives online and um, work through these questions. So just do them systematically. And that, you know, is basically all you need all you need to do so remember that the toolkit is there especially if you want to kind of go further at the end and um, kind of branch out into the to the rest of the collection or indeed use other archives as well what I'm going to do next is focus on some of the investigations on the site I'm just going to use a few examples you've actually got them in your in your red folders so I did some kind of printouts <coughs> from them so they're stapled together they just look like photocopies really so um, I'm not going to try and read the documents out while I'm talking but you can just read them 
while you're sitting there or if you've got laptops and things you're very welcome to follow along online as well all the all the investigations are structured the same way so the the points that i'm making about one of them will apply to all of them but i'm choosing a few examples to focus on hopefully to explain that we've got material in here that you might not expect us to have and also hopefully that we're doing things with this material that you might not expect us to be doing so one of the points I also wanted to make is that although we did get a donation to put this site together it's not about glorifying Churchill it's not about putting a particular view forward or saying you know that we think that Churchill was amazing and that everybody should be an admirer of him. It's about presenting the evidence and inviting people to challenge it. So I hope you, you can see that. So I'm not going to make you dizzy by zooming down the list of investigations, but they're down the left-hand margin here and we're adding to them all the time. I think we've got 17 or 18 on there now. I think the video we said 16, but we've moved on. So I'll start with appeasement and I'll just give you a little bit of the kind of layout um, of all of the investigations. So they all start with a very brief overview of the topic. So our question for this one is, did people agree with Churchill's stand on appeasement? And I think the interesting thing there is if you read Churchill's own account of the Second World War, you get this very powerful narrative that he was the prophet in profit in the wilderness, people weren't listening to him. He was warning of the dangers posed by Nazi Germany, but he wasn't listened to until it was almost too late. So I really like the fact that we're using his papers to actually challenge his own version of events um, with that question. We move on to the, the challenge at the bottom, which is always the same, a box of sources and using them to study that question. Each of the investigations has also got this more detailed background information. So what, what we're hoping for here is that this for your students is the key fact that they, they need to know to make sense of the documents we're showing them. It's the, the particular events, the personalities, the key dates. So it's a ready reference that they can go back to at any time if they're just thinking, hang on, what was, what was that about again? So hopefully they're not trying to kind of go off onto Wikipedia and make sense of what they're seeing. We've got it all presented for them here. So going down to the bottom, I'm going to go to the box of sources next. They're all different for each, each of the investigations. I think that's probably the nature of the beast. If you're asking different questions, you need to think about different sources. But what's common to all of them is there's probably around about eight to 10 different types of sources. And for each investigation, we're, we're choosing a range. So there might be newspaper clippings in their speech notes and letters. What there won't be is all of them newspaper clippings, because we do want people to try and think about weighting the different types of evidence and kind of considering different questions as they do so. So I'm just going to have a look at two of the documents in this section. So they, they should be, yeah, you've got them on your handouts here. So I think this is quite surprising that we can do this. Um, we, we're using for these sources basically history from below, letters from ordinary people. And we found these letters in Churchill's constituency post bag. So interestingly, I think, many archives and record offices don't keep constituency correspondence at all. If they get a politician's papers, the constituency papers will end up in the shredder. The National Archives and the sort of central government view is that there is no need for anybody to keep constituency correspondence because the way that government works is that somebody writes to their MP, so they write about the NHS, the MP writes to the, to the minister, writes to the min, Department of Health, and the, the letter and the reply to it is in the central archive in the Department of Health. I think that's massively wrong because I'm, I'm not sure that those records are that easily easy to find. And what you l lose if you get rid of constituency correspondence is a chronological view of what ordinary people 
were worried about and what they were motivated about enough to write to their MP. So interestingly, you know, Churchill loses the 1945 election, you know, very, very um, knocked back by that. Lots of discussion about why that happened. Was it that he wasn't thinking enough about domestic politics? If you look at his post bag, nearly all the letters are about war pensions, they're about homes for soldiers coming back. It's all on the domestic scene, health service and things. So I think it's a really fabulous resource. And it's one way you can, I mean, you can't say that a, one letter from a constituent is telling you about, you know, a certain percentage of the collection, but it does tell you a lot. So this is a letter from Miss Ackhurst. She's actually got quite nice writing and you can see it on your handout. Um, basically, her, her letter is saying that the First World War was so awful that we must avoid war at any cost. So she's begging Churchill to... Um, to not go to war. So at the bottom of the document, so we've got the, if it's more than one page, you'll see the second pages um, down the side. We follow it straight away with a simplified transcript. So that's a kind of easier version of what the document's saying so that the students don't have to feel put off by the handwriting. I think it's really nice for them to see it because it, it tells you something about it, but you know, there's no, there are no practical hurdles there. And then we've got the original transcript, so what the actual words on the page are. So if any of them are interested in trying to read it, this is the answers really. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got some, some more background information to this source. And then we move on to asking some questions for the students. So the surface level, what's worrying the writer of this letter and so on. And then the deeper level, getting them to think a little bit more widely about that document and, and kind of rank that source sort of as a bit of evidence. What do they think about it? And then for some of the sources, there's a bit of extra help at the bottom. And that's that varies a lot. For this letter, there's not an enormous amount of extra information added. For some of them, there's a lot more context there because the, the documents are a bit more complex and they're covering wider ranges. So I'll move on to look at source four, which should be the next one in your pack two. So this is another letter from one of Churchill's constituents, so writing about the same time. And you can see he is He's very much more on Churchill's side of things. He's very keen that we need to stop this persistent humiliation and um, we do need to get the English back among the honourable peoples who stand by their pledges. So we've got, got just interesting ways really of using the archive to, to think about ordinary people and also think about, you know, writing to your MP now. It's a lot easier now, isn't it? I can just Google them, click on an email link. If, if you know, if my daughter's school has sent me a petition that they want me to send, I can cut and paste the contents of that, you know, suggested letter and whiz it off to the MP in a matter of moments. Not so for these people. They're sitting down and writing longhand. And it's good sometimes to put yourself in the shoes of the letter writer and just think about how long that would have taken and how much more engaged you've got to be to do it. So that's the first one. I'm going to move on next. Sorry if this is kind of whizzing about a little bit. I'm going to go back to the big list of all the resources and I'm going to look at towards the bottom the second bit of the um, special relationship so you can see that we've actually got um, we've got three special relationship bits that's very much part of this being a global resource but we're going to look at um, sorry I don't want part one I want part two so I want it once once America has joined into the war basically um, laid out exactly the same structure as the last one with a brief introduction and then a much more detailed one so I won't go through that because oh sorry 
Oh, I've forgotten to do the notes for teachers. I am sorry, I was meant to do that with the first one, but I've remembered it now, so that's all right. Um, all of the investigations have got these pages as well. Um, suggestions for teachers, they're very open, no, no need for you to follow them, but hopefully, hopefully useful. They're giving you some ideas of activities you might use the um, sources in this investigation, ways you might use them in the classroom. So you can see the explanation in the beginning is that we've built up the selection to explore the relationship between the UK and the States. Um, you can work through the whole load of sources or you can pair up people, get small groups working on different ones. So we're suggesting that these are the sorts of things you can explore with this box of sources. So the special relationship was only at the level of personal friendship only at an operational level or only at the future vision level and getting them just to again kind of look at the whole set of sources and have a think about those collections and then activity two what sort of picture do we get about the relationship between the two countries and some interesting pointers at the bottom really letters and telegrams tell you about what's happening at the time personal letters tell you about what the letter writer thinks you know, you just, just, you know, you, the last one, personal letters are useless because they only tell you about one person. Well, it's true, isn't it? it, it you know, but we, we know that we can build it up into a more significant picture. And then the third one, what factors influence the relationship between Britain and the States? So interesting pointers there, should you want them? And then again, we've got the box of sources. So I'm just gonna check which ones I wanted to look at because I've forgotten what numbers they are. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna look at the first one first. So this again is in your pack here. This is a personal letter from Roosevelt to Churchill in October 42. So like I was saying with the constituency letters, I think it's really interesting that Roosevelt chose to write this by hand. For heaven's sake, he didn't have to. He had staff coming out of his ears. He could have dictated it and done it much quicker than that. I often get the visitors, visiting students here to just look at how neat things are and think about, you know, no crossings out. They're, are they angry? Are they calm? Are they taking their time over this, being careful, doing it in a rush? There are all these clues about that just because it's a, a handwritten letter. And sometimes I know that textbooks have primary sources which are just excerpts, which are just typed out. And I think that's you know, that is so much less than what a primary source can really be because they, I'm sorry these are in black and white, I wish they were in colour, but you can still see, can't you, much more about the kind of physical engagement and you can get the student to think about how would this document have actually been created. So Roosevelt's writing is quite hard, like everybody's writing though, if you practice it a bit it gets better as you go on, but I will sort of whiz down to the transcript here just so we can have a quick look at the overview and see it's it's interesting Churchill has asked Roosevelt to visit the um, Great Britain lots of times and Roosevelt hasn't come and this is a kind of compromise he's sending his wife Eleanor Roosevelt over to see Churchill and Clementine Churchill and then we end up with kind of a peer-to-peer -peer exchange here so you know, the big picture is, is, is America outnumbered with the, the amounts of forces and ships and planes on the Japanese side. And then also at the bottom, both Churchill and Roosevelt have headaches with the media and with the press. The newspaper owners are something of a headache to both of them. So it's interesting to kind of see the engagement there, the fact that Churchill's calling, um, sorry, Roosevelt's calling Churchill Winston. It's all quite Pally. Um, and then we'll have a look at another source. So I'm just going to remind myself which number it is. So number five, again, it should all be in your pack. I was uh, laboring over a hot photocopier yesterday and I hope I got them in the right order. So here is a copy of a telegram from Churchill to Roosevelt. It's not a reply to the, to the one we were looking at just before, but I just wanted to make a few points about this document um, 
that have occurred to me because of working with the collection for so long. I, I really wish this was in colour because the top bit there where it says Prime Minister's personal telegram is bright red in the original. These were stamps that went on these documents. And I think it's very, very interesting. If you, if you look at the format of this document, I'll whiz down a bit so you can read the um, content while I'm talking. It's, it's not a personal telegram at all. It's an official document. It's him communicating to Roosevelt. So what was he doing getting them stamped up as personal telegrams? Well, he was having an eye to the future and thinking about Churchill the writer and Churchill the historian. He'd already written the history of the First World War and he'd used a lot of contemporary documents to tell that story. And he was thinking while he was fighting the Second World War about writing about it later on. So from the moment that he started as Prime Minister, he started this um, unbroken sequence of what he called personal telegrams and personal minutes. They are a fabulous source because they're literally chronological and you can see exactly the communications that went out in the order that they went out. But he was basically labelling them up so that he would be able to take them out of Downing Street when he left office and keep them as sources to write the history later. And the people who worked with Churchill and knew him very well knew this as well. So it's not a particular case, the, the one I've got here, but some of them have got very, very Churchillian purple phrases in them, purple passages, when they are really kind of matters of business, these exchanges. And uh, some people would say, I got another chapter of Winston's book today because they knew that he was sort of doing this. And the other interesting thing about the personal telegrams, I think, is, is one that they, by labelling them up like this, Churchill was able to take them out of, of kind of official custody. But he also then got approval from the Cabinet Office to be able to quote for the, from them. So when he started writing the history of the Second World War, he was given permission to quote from his own personal uh, minutes and telegrams, this sequence of correspondence. He wasn't given permission to use any other government documents. And you might think, well, that's as it should be. He shouldn't have been allowed to be um, quoting other people there. But don't forget that the, the net result of that is that there's only one voice. Churchill was allowed to publish quite early about the Second World War because of who he was, who was going to say no to him at that point. And so it comes out as this very, very strong personal view of the Second World War. And it has, I think, influenced to this day, really, the narrative of events. So I think it's quite interesting that we can see in this kind of fairly normal looking stamp, I think there's quite a lot that you can unpack behind that, um, which I find really, really fascinating. But I'll go, go back to the point of the investigation now. So this is um, Churchill writing to Roosevelt. And if we look at the, um, the tone here, it's quite pleading, really. I think it's definitely telling you something about the balance of power in the, in the special relationship. Churchill here, if I move the mouse, is using oh, UJ, Uncle Joe, for Stalin. So again, quite pally, like, like Roosevelt. Um, the third paragraph here, he's, he's saying, you know, you've, you've said that you were going to come and visit the... Great Britain, but you're, you're not going to come. You can see his disappointment there. And then he moves on in, in the last paragraph and the second page to exp set out his worries that Roosevelt is going to move US troops out of Europe um, as soon as the war is over. And then um, the UK won't be able to sort of defend Europe against the Germans. So again, balance of power, America's really important. Churchill's kind of, not exactly cap in hand here, but he doesn't seem like the senior partner in this relationship. So I think these documents are really, really interesting ways of kind of exploring different things. I'm going to look at one final one with you, just because it allows me to look at a couple of different types of record, but doing the same thing as before. Hopefully I haven't forgotten anything now. Um, but we're going to look at 
Cold War politics now and Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, which he made in Fulton, Missouri in 1946. So like all the other ones, we've got all our context here and the background information and notes for teachers and the sources themselves. So we will look, again these are in your packs for you, we'll look at Churchill's notes for his Iron Curtain speech. I'm just going to go onto the third page of this because it is the one with the golden phrase, which is what we want. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about these records, uh, speech notes. So um, very early in Churchill's political career, he stood up in the House of Commons and he wanted to talk about army reform. He always practised his speeches very, very um, well, he prepared them meticulously and he committed them to memory. So when he stood up and delivered a speech, it was a monumental feat of recall. He was uh, standing up and just delivering this speech. So it wasn't that because there were no notes, it wasn't crafted. It's just he didn't think he needed the notes. But he stood up in the House of Commons and he completely lost the thread of what he wanted to say. He stood up words failed him and he had to sit down. He was mortified about it and his father had died early, died of syphilis we think, not that that was widely known at the time, um, but died very early and was thought to be quite unstable certainly by the end of his career and a lot of people said that you know oh here we are again is another another Churchill, there's nothing to him, he's unstable, he hasn't got it in him and that kind of really hit home with him. So luckily enough for us archivists, from that point on, he not only did his meticulous preparation and crafting, but he also had speech notes for everything he said pretty much, um, prepared them very, very thoroughly. So this is the, um, this is the golden phrase really from the Iron Curtain speech and I just wanted to show you the layout of the page so it was called psalm style it looks like blank verse if you're you know want to have fun with your students you can have get them to have a go at being Churchill by using the the layout it does seem to help you a bit with the pausing the emphasis and the and the intonation but actually they were laid out like this for a very very practical reason it was just so that he didn't lose his place while he was speaking the the jagged outlines and all that white space make it really easy to keep your your place if you run your finger down the side. So when, when we go over to our exhibition, which we're doing after coffee, I'll show you a photo of Churchill where you can just see some of these speech notes poking out of his pocket. And I must say, when I look at the originals and then I see photos of him delivering speeches or film footage, I do have a kind of shiver down the spine. I think, oh, those are the real deal, those, those notes that we have. So, um, the speech notes then, and this is a really, it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous investigation, this one, I think, because it, it brings uh, the whole man to the fore, which is really the, the, um, the best thing about the collection, I think, because we know with the benefit of hindsight that this speech was incredibly significant. Our investigation is something like, um, did, um, did this, speech start the Cold War, you know, lots of people pinpointed it as the moment that the Cold War started and Churchill got this um, reputation, the sound bite from the speech was this one, the one we've got up here, and the reputation was that, that, that he'd kind of, it was a call to war with the Soviet Union. It was a, it was a much, much longer speech, there's a, a link to it there. In fact, Churchill's title for it was something very different, it was the sinews of peace, and it was all about how America and Britain and the English-speaking peoples should work together with the Soviet Union to, to bring about world peace. So it wasn't really meant to be the call to arms, but we know now with politicians and their sound bites how a phrase will take off and that will become the one thing that's reported really. And that's what happened with this speech. And it's also fascinating because it's 1946 and Churchill's out of office and that was really, really hard for him, very difficult to lose the 45 election. But the other thing post-war for him is that he's no longer 
in the official channels of communication. He doesn't really know what's going on in the world. He's got this enormous reputation and he is a sort of international statesman, but he doesn't know what Truman and Attlee are talking about with atomic weapons, and he can't, he can't be told. And we can see in the papers, the correspondence with him and Attlee particularly, and Truman, how they're being very polite, quite deferential, but they're keeping him at arm's length. It's, it's not his business any longer. So Churchill goes to the States to, to make this speech, to, to go on a lecture tour, but he's at a kind of, crisis in his life it's um we know he goes on to have a second premiership but it wasn't obvious to him that that's what the future held for him he was he was quite old and he was feeling extremely tired and very kind of broken i think and then he goes with um truman to this small town in the rural midwest and the impact of them traveling there they go on this special train and then the world's media follows them makes this speech and it's reported all around the world the interesting things that happen also is that both Attlee and um, Truman distance themselves from the message in the speech, even though, as you can see in this investigation, both of them knew exactly what he was going to say. And we know for sure, even though Truman said he didn't see it, that he'd read it on the special train on the way to Fulton, Missouri. So it's a, it's a turning point for Churchill. It's a turning point in, in world affairs, in global power as well. And I think what's really interesting is the way we can kind of think about the impact of the speech globally, but we can also think about the impact of, of it on Churchill the man. So the second source and the final one I'm going to show you is, I'll just find my box of sources again. It is here. So he's made the Fulton speech on the 5th of March, and then we're going to go forward just 10 days to um, the 15th of March. I'm going to go on to the second page of this speech now. That's the one I want. So again, it's in your, it's in your pack. So this is an earlier form of speech notes, and we often have those in our collection. You can see the process of crafting a speech. You often have whole bunches of typescript like this which have got lots and lots of Churchill's annotations, blocks of texts are being moved around. There's a lot of preparation that leads into that psalm style speaking notes final form that we saw before for the Fulton speech. And here's a draft um, of this speech which Churchill kind of writes while he's out in America because the, the Fulton speech has a bigger impact than he could possibly have hoped and he is absolutely delighted by that. He is right back in the centre of things which is where he wants to be and he's writing this speech which he gives to um, businessmen in New York, that was the, the occasion for this speech, but it's um, he's writing it while he's out there because things have changed, things have moved on, he's feeling different and actually he's had a big impact. And I just wanted to highlight this deletion really. So we know that Churchill didn't actually say this um, in the speech, but I just think you can really see the man here. So it's, I was surprised to read the cataract of condemnation poured out upon my head two days ago by Generalissimo Stalin. So that's Stalin's response to the Fulton speech. It's extraordinary that the head of a mighty victorious government should descend from his august seat of power to enter into personal controversy with a man who has no official position of any kind and has been particularly careful to say that he spoke without the authority of any government. So wisely, I think Churchill chose to delete this passage, but I kind of feel that this is sometimes, you know, when, he, when you're in the heat of the moment and you're drafting something, sometimes it's good with emails, isn't it? To sort of get it all out and then delete it and not decide to send it. But I think that this is kind of what we can see here with um, Churchill in this draft and you can just kind of go right in. I mean, of course, he's absolutely delighted that he's had this massive impact and he's also um, 
you know, so he doesn't think that he's a man without influence in any sense. And we know that what happened after that is he, he goes home on the boat and he's already decided what he's going to do next is write the history of the Second World War. He's completely invigorated, fired up, and he's, you know, ready to go again. So the Cold War speech is a turning point for, for him very much personally. So that really brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about, really. I just wanted to really emphasise that this is here for you. I hope that you might be um, motivated to have a look at it and maybe use it with your students. Do ask me any questions that you want and also let us have feedback. We'd really love to know how we could make this easier for you to use, better, um, deliver more of what you need. Um, but I hope that you might be inspired to have a go with it and, um, you know, do some of that fantastic stuff, bringing history to life. Thank you.